Hey mama, it's Tori here. Before the show gets going, I want to invite you to become a member of the Momsiety Club. Members not only help to support the making of the show, but you'll get access to a wonderful supportive group of moms online where you can ask whatever questions or just event what you need, as well as weekly exercise classes to give your body a little boost along with your mind so you're refreshed for the rest of the week. And if you can't make it live, you can get access to all the replays in the members area. Just head to join.momsietyclub.com and click on the join the Momsiety club button. And if you're looking for a more individualized approach, there are some year end sales and specials for weekly one-on-one movement and mindset sessions where you decide, do you want to work on movement on mindset or both? Just head to join.momsietyclub.com. All right, let's get to the show. Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, a former mental health worker with degrees in psychology and criminal justice, so I know the importance of keeping calm in a difficult situation. But when I had my kids, I found myself full of anxiety. One day, everything clicked and I made a commitment to own my anxiety so it doesn't own me. And that's why I started the Momsiety Club podcast. Each week, we'll discuss the ups, the downs, and anxieties of motherhood. So join me and let's get rid of this Momsiety together. Welcome to episode 17 of the Momsiety Club podcast. Today, you are going to meet Allison Q. Terre. She is a fellow mama, EMT, first-time mom of an 18-month-old little girl named Lexi, hyperemesis warrior, lover of books and chocolate, and just fun all around. First, I just want to say thank you for listening. I love hearing from you and helping and supporting you however I can. There are a few ways you can connect after the podcast is over. Reach out on social media. I'm at Momsiety Club on Instagram and Facebook. And remember, that's M O M X I E T Y Club. You can uh, reach out via email, hello at momsietyclub.com, or you can record a short voicemail by clicking the leave a voicemail button at join.momsietyclub.com. You can just say hi, share a milestone that your little one has reached that you are excited to talk about, or share something that you are struggling with right now in motherhood and something you'd like to hear discussed on a future episode. Just as in previous episodes, anything that you may want to look up later will be referenced in the show notes, which are below. So if you're driving, rocking the baby to sleep, making dinner, folding laundry, any of the other amazing multitasking mom superpowers that you have, you don't need to worry about taking a note and remembering what you wanted to go to Google for later. And for those of you already on the Momsiety Club email list, you get a link to the latest episode where you can click and find all of those show notes as well in the email you get from me each week. For those not already on the list, sign up for access to free resources for new and not so new moms at join.momsietyclub.com. And one last announcement If you have a smart speaker at home, did you know that in addition to subscribing to the podcast on your phone, you can also listen on your smart speaker. All you have to do is say, hey, whatever you call your smart speaker. I don't want to set it off for you right now, but say, hey, uh, play the Momsiety Club podcast. All right. Lastly, before we get into the interview with Allison, I want to mention that we talk a lot about medical appointments and conditions and experiences we've had with our own children with food allergies and intolerances. We discuss our children and the conversations we had with their doctors. Please remember that each case and each child is unique and nothing we speak about in this podcast should be taken as medical advice to treat, cure, or diagnose any possible disease or condition. If you have concerns about your child's health, you should call and speak with your pediatrician immediately. Remember, this podcast is a place for moms to vent and discuss our shared experiences to let other moms know they are not alone. 
I hope you enjoy, and if you have concerns about your child's health, that this gives you the confidence to reach out to your child's doctor without fear of being labeled that worried mom who calls about every bump and bruise, every rash, every different diaper. No one knows your child better than you, and no one can be a better advocate for your child than you. All right, here is my conversation with Allison. Hi, Allison. Thank you so much for joining me on the Mom's Anxiety Club podcast today. Uh, I'm, you have so much to share, um, and I'm excited just to dive in. So can you just give us a brief intro into you and if you had anxiety before you were pregnant or if it was a new thing after you had your daughter? Tell us sure. about so, um, I, my name is Allison. Um, I am 29 and I have struggled with anxiety pretty much my whole life. Um, I was, we child medicines for a while. And, um, one of the things I chose to do before I got pregnant was to voluntarily cut back on those meds because I wanted to be as safe as possible during pregnancy. I ended up getting really, really sick during my pregnancy, Uh, So that was a stressful time, Um, but I did manage to cope, I guess, uh, the best that I could, um, regularly checking in with my therapist. Then when my daughter was born, um, it was just really a whirlwind of emotions, and I feel like one of the things I was not prepared for was the surge of hormones and just how crazy that would be trying to deal with that. Um, She immediately had some feeding issues, some weight issues. Um, She was an intrauterine growth restricted baby. So she was already born on the small side and then she ended up losing a lot of weight in the hospital. Um, Her jaundice, they really could not get under control for a little bit. Um, So even though we were discharged, we were doing regular testing for her. Um, So that was a struggle. And then as a newborn, all she did was scream pretty much all the time. So that was, for lack of a better term, incredibly triggering to me. Um, I had a lot of thoughts of why am I so bad at this? Why can't I make her not scream? What am I doing wrong? Um, My husband works in law enforcement, so he didn't have a lot of time off. He had to go right back into a pretty Uh, demanding schedule with a lot of weird hours. And so I was home with her by myself a lot, just wondering what I was doing wrong. Um, So that really, um, I went back to see my therapist once a week. I got put back on several different medications. Um, I mean, there were several times when I remember just crying and begging my husband to stay home from work and just saying, I don't know what to do. I I literally have no idea how to handle this. Um, So I was as equipped as I felt to handle my own anxiety from previous years of medication and therapy, um, that was all kind of on my own anxiety terms. Now I was tasked with dealing with anxiety related to this tiny helpless baby that needed me and I didn't know what to do to help her and I couldn't make it better. So that was just that was definitely the hardest thing to do. And it took months to get our official diagnoses and get everything figured out and get her back on the right track. Um, so the first probably 12 weeks of her life were just ridiculous. And I remember the OB saying to me, you know, two weeks of baby blues is normal. And, um, after the two weeks hit, I just remember thinking this is not getting better. This is not easier. This is not any different. And if anything, it's harder because now I realize that the two weeks are up and they, they kind of made me feel like this was this magical time period that after you hit these, this 14 day window, everything will get so much better. And I remember thinking it's been 14 days now, it's been 15 days now, it's been 16 days and this isn't easier. (laughs) I'm not good at this. I'm still not happy. This isn't better. So, um, the short answer would be, yes, I've, I've struggled with anxiety um, my whole life, but this was a whole new version of anxiety. This was a type of anxiety I had never experienced. And I, again, I trace it back to um, it's totally different to be nervous about things that affect only you. And then, Mm -hmm. now, you know, not only am I a caregiver, I'm supposed to be the mom that is supposed to be able to fix everything. The mom has all the answers. The mom is, 
you know, supposed to be able to make everything better and I couldn't. So that was just really, really tough for me to deal with. And we were in mom's group together and you just did not get to sleep either. Correct. Both of our babies were just not sleepers. And that was always the thing that the facilitator would be like, so how was, did you sleep at all last night? Did you sleep at all last night? (laughs) And that only exacerbates anxiety. And yes, so that in addition to everything else. And since we did know each other in mom's group, so a lot of the things you were talking about that um, your daughter was going through were really reminded me of things my first what ribbon what went through with food intolerances and everything. And I, I remember just aching for you <laughs> because I was like, oh, I've been there, mama. I have gone through these things. I know it's not a quick fix and I know you want it to be a quick fix, but, and you dealt with so much more because she was diagnosed with F pies, right? Yeah. So she was diagnosed you... with that and she was failure to thrive for a good while. She wasn't gaining any weight, but I remember hearing you say just very briefly, because obviously you're in the mom's group with your second son and you had just said, you know, try this, do that, because it's such a different ball game. The, the regular sleep training, the regular schedules that for lack of a better term, normal moms, yeah. with healthy babies that don't have issues. Uh, that doesn't work because with my daughter's name is Lexi and Lexi was not, she was not crying to be, um, you know, just because she didn't want to sleep or because she wasn't tired or because she was uncomfortable. She was screaming because she was in pain all the time. Right. And, uh, one of the things with her food allergies, it made her unable to absorb nutrients properly until we completely eliminated them from her diet and we couldn't figure out what to eliminate. So until we did that, she was also starving. I mean, she was screaming because she was hungry, but she also was refusing to to take any food because it caused pain. So we were in a sort of catch 22 where she's suffering, she's starving, she's in pain, but she also doesn't want to eat because that causes more pain. So we were just at a total loss. Great. Um, How did you go about them? Because I think we, I just see a lot of myself in you (laughs) because of just being prone to being anxious and then adding in a child who is sick and not, I mean, parenting a child who has a cold, who has the flu, anything like that is rough, but parenting someone who has a chronic illness is, it's always there. So how did you go about you know, getting her diagnosed and was that helpful to your anxiety or did that exacerbate it? Because again, there, there can be like, Oh, it's helpful this way, but it's worse this way. Right. So before, um, before I knew anything about this, I actually started going to mom's group and I am so thankful that I did because she was about six, six weeks old and I was still terrified. It was only a 20 minute drive from our house, but I was like, how am I going to do this drive? Cause all she does is scream. Um, but I went and that's when I met you and several other moms and the facilitator who had taught our childbirth class, who knew my history of my difficult pregnancy. And I remember coming in and at first I was so intimidated because all the other babies were laying there quietly and playing with their toys. They were being held or nursing or snuggling and mine was just screaming. And I was like, I'm so sorry. Maybe I should leave. This is a horrible idea. But everybody really rallied around me and said, it's okay. Like everyone's babies do this. It's okay. And I was like, but this is all she does. And that was really the first time that I saw you know what? I'm right. Something isn't wrong because our first pediatrician, we actually switched pediatricians three times before she was two months old because I am not trained in babies. I'm not trained, um, in eating issues in in food intolerances, but I have been an EMT for 10 years. Um, so I've heard different cries and I just kept thinking there's, there's gotta be something that's not right here. And the first pediatrician even told us that she's just a bad eater and she's just a bad sleeper. And I remember thinking, I don't know what, what baby 
would be born and just choose not to eat and choose to be hungry. And we did weighted feeds when I was still attempting to breastfeed her. We supplemented with formula right off the bat from the hospital with the jaundice and with how much weight she had lost. Uh, Once she dipped below five pounds, they were really um, nervous about her. They started having to do glucose testing. They started having to keep her in a warmer. Um, and they just kind of, the first pediatrician really dismissed everything I was saying. And I remember she handed me a packet about colic and basically said, you know, oh, it's okay to just sit her in a safe place and walk away. And I was like, if you heard the way she was screaming, you wouldn't be able to do that either. Because again, this, this quality of cry and scream was essentially begging for help. Something was wrong. So, uh, when I went to mom's group, that was the first time I really felt validated that, you know, babies don't do this. This isn't something that I should just say, you know, Oh, okay. Well, she's just an angry baby because she was six weeks old. They're not, they're not born angry. They're not born to refuse. So I went back to the pediatrician and I said, look, she's just not eating. And I, we put her on the scale again. Um, you know, stripped down, not even a diaper because every ounce, every half ounce. Mm -hmm. And I was like, she didn't gain weight again in another week. And when they're that little, especially when they're born in the five pound weight range, they watch carefully. And I, I just said, something is not okay. And she said, you know, maybe it's the formula. So we trialed formulas. And then she said, maybe it's dairy formula. So we trialed a soy formula. And this whole time she would swing wildly between Um, I wouldn't even say constipation, but she wouldn't poop for six to eight days. And they basically made me feel guilty for not breastfeeding her uh, and said, well, breastfeeds don't get constipated, but formula fed babies do. And that's not true. (laughs) That's not true. I remember saying, okay, I'm really sorry. I was sick for nine months to the point that I had a feeding tube in. So I wasn't producing enough and she had latch issues. She had undiagnosed posterior tongue ties and lip ties that the pediatrician also missed. Um, so I was like, you know, I'm, I'm just doing what I can to keep her growing. I don't know what you want from me. And that was another trigger. And I remember I came home, uh, from that appointment And I told my husband about it and he was just like, we need to ask somebody else because this isn't, and I felt like all my power had been taken away. I'm a very strong advocate for myself, for my husband, for my patients, but with a new baby, I was completely, again, this is my first time being a mom. I don't know. So I was listening to this pediatrician thinking again, it must be me. It must be something that's wrong with me, or Mm -hmm. it must be, I I couldn't breastfeed her and that um, must be my fault. That must be why she can't go to the bathroom or she must hate the formula. And so between the constipation or the lack of going to the bathroom issues. And once we passed 24 hours, I just remember sitting there praying she would poop because every day that passed past that 24 hour point of her last bowel movement became increasing agitation for her, just screaming, lack of sleep, didn't want to eat, her little belly would get bloated. So again, it was something that clearly isn't right, but no one was willing to listen to me. So we went to the second pediatrician and they basically said, we have no idea what's going on, but we're out of our league here. So you need to see a GI. And I was like, thank you. Yeah. Point me somewhere. Well, the three closest large hospitals could not see her. One of them gave us an appointment in February. This was in June. And I said, what do you want me to do with my daughter that can't eat from now until February? What do you want me to do with her? Because she's, you know, 10 weeks old at this point and you're telling me you can't see her. So we found, we've also been through four GIs um, until we found someone who listened because uh, with her food intolerance, it is considered an allergy, but it's not an IgE mediated allergy. So it is not an anaphylactic. It's not a full body systemic reaction that she has. So it doesn't show up on blood and skin tests. So we right. were given blood and skin tests with allergists. We were given food challenges with GIs and she appeared to pass all these foods that were causing issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, So all they were hearing was this first time sleep deprived mom saying, but it's still not right, but something's still wrong. And all these doctors kept saying, well, all her tests are normal. And I was just like, how can that be? So we finally found a GI who was two hours away in Allentown. And I was like, you know what? I'll drive. I don't care. And I called their office on a Monday and they said, can you bring her in Thursday? I said, absolutely. Told my husband to take a personal day and we got ready. 
I gathered everything from all the doctors we had been to. And I remember he walked into the room, this poor man, and just said, how can I help you? And I was like, you want to help me? And he, I just started crying. I was like, I don't know, but something's not okay. So he was the first one he did. Um, we had an upper GI and a lower GI series done. She had scopes done. She had an esophageal biopsy. They were testing for eosinophilic esophagitis, which mm -hmm. is a condition. Um, they did barium swallow study and a barium enema on this poor tiny baby of mine, but they had to get all this testing done to see what was going on. And then the worst part of that was all those came back normal too. The only thing they found was severe intestinal swelling. Um, and the way they described it to me was her intestines are so inflamed that there's no way she can absorb nutrients, which would explain the failure to thrive. And the only thing they saw in the upper GI series was evidence of esophageal erosion, which is very uncommon in a 12 week old baby, but her reflux was so severe. And I, I was terrified of what that meant. Um, I knew structurally nothing was wrong. There was nothing scary. There were no masses. There was no bleeding. There was nothing to be fixed by surgery essentially. But my next question was, why is this happening? Why is it like this? And, um, that was that first GI. And he sat down and explained to me, there is something that's not very common and it's not well understood. They have no idea what causes this. Um, just like I said, with the testing, it's pretty much a rule out diagnosis. You make sure everything else is normal. And then there's this diagnosis called f -pies, which is food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. Um, he compared it almost to a celiac disease, mm -hmm. um, which is the more well-known, you know, in adults, people can't eat wheat, gluten, it causes them really distressing GI symptoms. And he said, that's what Lexi has, but her allergies are to milk, soy, and corn. And the way we found this out um, with F pies, you can't just do a food challenge. Like people would think with an allergen, like peanut butter, give it once. If they don't get hives, that's cool. They're good. No. Or even give it a couple times. Um, with Lexi, her normal reaction time is four to five days, depending on how often she's eaten food and how much. So it has to build up in her system enough to trigger the reaction. However, her reactions then last two to three weeks of um, bloody diarrhea, screaming in pain, severe reflux episodes to the point of projectile vomiting. Um, all her reactions are defined as chronic reactions, which is why they last so long. There's another form of f -pies that has acute reactions where essentially it's vomit to shock. Um, and, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's what is out there. Right. Um, that is if you Google it, not that I'm saying people should go. To it. Um, right, right, right. But that's the know, more... That up and down one, I guess. Right. That is known because, um, and there's a misunderstanding. So that's why it's so important to see a specialist, find a specialist. If like, if all these things were ruled out, uh, and I remember talking to you about that because there are doctors who just know the classic presentation. Yeah. And then you're still like, but this, this is it. I know it. Like you, in this situation, I want to say that this is where moms have to really, really trust their gut instinct because that is what, you know, what's going on with your child. You know, like you were talking about the different cries and different screams mm -hmm. is there, there is a difference coming again from a mom who has had two children with food intolerances that there is a difference in just a fussy cry and that pain. Right. And a, something is, is truly wrong. Right. And, um, so then, you know, I had a lot of crying about that. I felt so guilty because I'm thinking, you know, all the formulas we gave her had all these allergens and what she would appear to quote unquote pass because she didn't react within the first couple of days, which is the conventional time period for trialing an allergen. Then a week would pass and she would start reacting. And I would say, I haven't changed anything. What did I do? But these, the first doctors were telling me, well, it can't be the formula because she's already been on it for a week. So that's not it. And the GI said, he was like, that's first of all, that's incorrect. Everyone should be trialing formulas. If you switch a formula, you should trial it for at least two weeks, especially with the baby when their only intake is formula, because it's true there, there's nothing else that's changing. So you need to give that the time to change, to, to see whether it's going to be a good improvement or a bad change. Um, 
And with Lexi, she needs an even longer time. So we ended up, um, it was a slow process to get her um, figured out essentially to find Mm -hmm. out what the triggers were. So the first one we eliminated was milk. We did go back to a soy formula, um, ended up giving her the same symptoms. And as soon as we would realize the symptoms were there, we would pull her back off of that. We ended up on a prescription hypoallergenic formula um, to, and we essentially mixed it at almost 1.25 times the mixing instructions to supplement her with calories. So we were giving her a conventional infant formula is 20 calories per ounce. She was getting 30 calories per ounce because she was failure to thrive. Um, and they needed that we were threatened with a feeding tube several times. If she didn't start gaining enough weight, if she wasn't eating enough ounces, um, they normally like to see about 24 ounces per day for an intake for an infant of roughly a one ounce per hour conversion. Not that they need to be eating one ounce per hour, but you know, if they eat every three hours, they should eat three ounces, something like that. Uh, Lexi was hovering in the 12 ounces in a 24 hour period. So she was getting half of what they wanted her to get. And the caveat to that was that she was eating, you know, a few sips every 40 minutes, including overnight, which is why I wasn't sleeping. And the GI looked me in the eye and he said, that's not how this is supposed to work. And that's okay. We will get her there. But just so you know, this isn't forever. And it made me cry again because I was like, she'll get better. This, this will be okay. And I will sleep because it's also hard. Social media is, a great and a terrible thing. Um, yeah. had a, lot of, a lot of friends, coworkers, college friends, high school friends, family, even who had babies and they only posted the positives and even, even being sleep deprived, I'm sure with a healthy kid is tough. And all I'm hearing is, you know, Oh, my six month old gave me an eight hour stretch. I was like, my six month old gave me a 45 minute stretch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And so my husband and I were, we were literally just keeping our heads above water and we were doing these food trials. We we're doing these formula trials. And the other thing they wanted to do was medicate her for reflux, but we couldn't do that right away because that would be another thing that would be essentially considered an allergen trial. Right. We went through five reflux meds and the common denominator, this is how we found out about the corn allergy was they were all corn based. Uh, one of the binders they use in liquid medicine, a common one is xanthan gum, and it's most commonly derived from corn. And some of them can't be made. Nexium is one of them that we tried. And it was the first three days were amazing because it was like the reflux is gone. The acidic smell to her, the burps, the spitting up, the fussiness, the gas is gone. And then on day four and five, the diarrhea would start and the screaming would start. And I was just like, what is happening? And so certain of those drugs can't be made without corn. There's no such thing. So we ended up on Zantac that has to be specialty compounded for her that's made without corn, um, which is a little bit more expensive. We're fortunate to have a compounding pharmacy that's right near us. Then the Zantac recall happened. So they switched her to Pepsid that also has to be specialty compounded. Um, Fortunately, she tolerated that switch really well. Um, And throughout all of this, we were delayed in trialing solid foods. She was about eight or nine months old before we trialed her first solid food. Um, Because one of the things we did, so when we had that first GI or that, well, the first GI that listened to us, I should say maybe the fourth or fifth doctor overall, (laughs) he finally prescribed, he immediately sent us, he was like, I need, I want you in a feeding clinic. I want (laughs) in, um, I want you to have an evaluation by an OT, by a speech therapist. You need to see a dietitian because he, he was wonderful. And one of the things I respect about him most is that he said, you know, I'm a GI, I can prescribe all the tests, but there are people that are better with watching swallowing and watching reflux symptoms and watching oral development and with making sure all the dietary needs are met. So he was more than happy to send us to other people. Um, So we have this great team through early intervention, which now it's just an OT and a dietitian. But even over a year later, I still meet with them every single week. Um, We had, we thought initially um, she might have an oral dysphagia thing and it turned out she, she did, it was more of um, 
really a reluctance out of almost fear to eat. And the GI said that we don't kind of give babies enough credit. He said, all this child has ever known is every time you eat, something bad happens. So she was eating those tiny, tiny sips, literally enough to basically keep herself alive and no more because it would cause pain or it would cause reflux or it would cause diarrhea. And she started associating that. So when we finally got her on a formula that worked for her, she was still afraid to take it. So we worked for months getting her. I would track every single ounce, every single time she would drink, even if it was Lexi took three sips at 2.45 a.m., every entry, uh, every diaper. We were weighing diapers. We were counting dirty diapers. We were saving poopy diapers and taking pictures of them to make sure that they looked normal, that there wasn't mucus and blood in them and Mm -hmm. testing and all kinds of crazy things were happening. So that in itself was also exhausting. And for somebody with anxiety, that's a lot. You know, did I miss something? Did I forget? Is this good enough? Um, And guessing yourself going, oh, I think that's this, but you know, that's probably just normal. And I'm just probably being overprotective about it. Right. Well, that's the other thing is then any normal symptoms she would have. So when she started teething, for instance, Mm -hmm. obviously all babies are fussy with teething. A lot of them have diarrhea from the excess saliva, from the drool. Right. Um, Some of them have an increase in reflux and not that reflux, I don't want to say it's common in babies, but there are plenty of babies that have infant reflux that is Mm -hmm. completely benign and it usually resolves and it's fine and it doesn't cause any issues. Some are medicated, some are not. So even that, um, anything that would happen that was abnormal would immediately make me run to what has she eaten in the past couple of days? How much has she been eating? Has she had dirty diapers? Has she been peeing enough? Is she dehydrated? Is something else wrong? Did I give her something? Um, and this, when she was only formula fed, it was a little bit easier now that she's 18 months old, um, and on solid food, I get a little bit more nervous. Um, again, anytime she has a cold, anytime she's teething, I run, I literally cut out uh, ingredient labels from her food. And I paste them in a food journal that we have for her. And I can look back and see, did anything change? Did I give her anything? Did I miss? Um, the corn allergy is incredibly difficult because unlike dairy and soy, it is not listed as one of the top eight or now nine allergens that the FDA considers uh, necessary to be labeled on packaging. So a lot of people, um, can, you know, recall- Just take a we can just take a glance. Yeah. It has to be printed in clear English in mm-hmm. the, on the food label, either does contain or may contain or even processed in a facility with wheat, dairy, soy, um, I mean, I believe it's peanuts, peanuts selfish. selfish. Uh, they just added sesame is the ninth one. Corn is not one of those. And since corn is huge in the United States, especially, um, corn is the cheap use for, a lot of different things. Um, so for instance, one of the things I have to look for, um, in every ingredient label, even if something just says sugar, unless I call the company and confirm that it's either beet or cane sugar, she can't have it because I have to assume it's a dextrose or it's a type of corn sugar that they're using. And a lot of times people use that because it's cheaper and it's just easier to get because corn is everywhere. Um, I have a list on my phone of 184 ingredients that I have to cross check with. Um, Some of them are always corn-based, like dextrose is literally corn sugar. So that is always out. Um, There are some, one of the big ones that gets us is natural flavors. Uh, They can pretty much hide anything under the natural flavors Mm -hmm. category. Um, And so that is one of the things I always have to watch. Um, We try not to feed her stuff that says natural flavors. Now, if you look at any packaging in the grocery store, try to find something that doesn't say natural flavorings, then that's very difficult. Um, The other one is vitamins, any added vitamins in foods, which in baby foods is really big because people want to say, oh, your baby's getting added vitamin E and vitamin C and calcium and vitamin D and all these good things that sound really great. Um, Synthetic vitamin E, which is known as mixed tocopherols. Tocopherols or something. Yeah, I just know that one too from... Um, she can't have those. Uh, The carrier oil for most of the vitamins, especially vitamin A and D is a corn oil. Um, unless it's 
specifically stated otherwise. Most of the preservatives, things like citric acid, uh, lactic acid, malic acid, all those things are corn based. Um, and it's, it's literally just because it's easier and it's accessible and cheaper for the food companies, which makes sense. Um, it stinks for us because that eliminates um, most of the prepackaged snacks and foods that mm-hmm. she can have. So um, 90% of her diet is organic, raw fruits and vegetables, uh, organically sourced meat. And the meat has to come from an animal that has not been corn fed, which is also difficult uh, because cheap animal feed on farms is a lot of times corn, corn right. based corn meal. Um, her eggs have to be from hens that have not been fed corn. She can't have commercial produce that you see in the grocery store because a lot of them are artificially ripened with ethylene gas, which is corn based. Most apples and citrus products have a wax on them to make them shiny and look more appealing. That's corn based. Um, even the packaging, I have to watch the packaging. Now, since she's not anaphylactic, she's not a contact sensitive kid. She's not even an ingest or an inhalation sensitive kid. She's only ingestion. So she has to eat and eat enough of it, which is nice. Cause if we are, um, at a play date or something and she happens to swipe another kid's goldfish or something mm-hmm. that probably is not going to be enough to trigger a full fledged reaction. She might have a sore belly for a day or two. Um, but the packaging, um, a lot of meats are preserved, not preserved, but packaged in like a, a dexterous solution or even a white vinegar solution just to keep the meat tender and flavorful. White vinegar is distilled from corn, so she can't have that. Um, even the brands that say organic, a lot of them, uh, a big I guess, bragging right for the food industry is to say, we don't use high fructose corn syrup, which is great, but all the preservatives are corn-based. All the vitamins are corn-based. Um, all the flavoring agents are corn-based. She can't have any, any sliced deli meat. All of it has dextrose or cornstarch in it. So it's that part, um, where you asked if it's better after her diagnosis. Yes, it is because I know why she suffered so much and why she was so upset for months. I know it wasn't my fault and I know it wasn't anything that I was doing, you know, horribly wrong. I'm not a terrible mom. I'm not, you know, failing her. So in that sense, it is better because I also felt validated where these first doctors were telling me, you know, nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. The tests are normal. And I kept saying something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, It was nice, even though you don't want anything to be wrong with your child. It was nice to know that I wasn't crazy and I was right and they should have listened to me. Right. On the flip side, avoiding corn is an incredibly, incredibly difficult task. So I get anxiety about not only foods to avoid because we need to avoid the corn, but foods to include in her diet to make sure that she gets a well-rounded diet as an 18-month-old growing kid who is incredibly active, um, despite all her food issues, she's, um, very well developed in the (laughs) social skills. She talks, she runs, she climbs, she does crazy things. So she burns a lot of calories Mm -hmm. and trying to make sure she gets enough protein. Um, one of the things actually, what you don't hear a lot of people, people try to avoid carbs. We had to make sure she was getting enough carbs (laughs) because most of the snack foods that kids and toddlers eat that are carb heavy are processed foods that have corn in them. So she can't have, I mean, she can't even have Cheerios off the shelf. I believe that, I believe that has soy in them, but, um, she inadvertently has an extremely healthy diet (laughs) would, would look great for an adult trying to lose or maintain their weight. But for a kid, she needs those healthy fats. She needs carbs. She needs, um, you know, a, a bit of a bulkier, I don't want to say less healthy diet, but to restrict a toddler to only raw organic produce and some lean meats here and there is actually doing them a bit of a disservice. Right. So she's still on toddler formula to fill those gaps. Um, we, and I, our doctor, Ruben's doctor yeah. said uh, with making, you know, focus on the fats rather than the sugars mm-hmm. or the calories. Yep. And her thing is make it disgusting. Yes. Yeah. Double butter the toast. Anytime I give him something, he like, he just wants to have a piece of toast. And I'm like, no, you need to have cream cheese on it. You need to have butter on it. You need to have this, that, you know, just make it as much as possible. Yeah. And that's, um, 
that's one of our challenges with Lexi is with avoiding also the dairy and the soy. A lot of the healthy fats come from dairy. From dairy, right? You can't have that. And a lot of the soy alternative or that sorry, the dairy alternatives are soy based. And even the ones that are not ha- containing dairy and soy tend to have some type of corn in them for a sugar or for like I said, a binding agent or to make it the texture smooth and nice and Mm -hmm. the form distribution or have added vitamins and minerals to try to compete with the calorie and fat and vitamin content of a dairy based food. Um, I guess the gold standard still seems to be cow's milk. So people add the the proteins and the calciums and the vitamin D to say, look, it's just like cow's milk or it has more than cow's milk. Um, because I Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that's that's it's just that's a lot of what people are still used to using as the standard. So right. all additives then tend to contain corn, so it makes it difficult. I do want to say just, just with the corn aside, we our children are lucky in a sense in this time period because there are so many things coming out with you know no dairy, no soy. Those were and no gluten. That was Rubens. Eli was like dairy, soy, egg, blah, blah, blah. So it was somewhat easier. We have not had to deal with the coin corn, but anytime I do find something that is like corn free, I can save it. Like (laughs) so I have said to my husband a couple of times, I said, thank goodness she wasn't born when we were like in the nineties because that it wasn't, I don't want to say trendy, but there's a lot of diets and food fads out there that say avoid X, Y, Z. So they're coming out with more and more alternatives and more and more different things. Um, we even found her a vegan butter substitute. Now we're not vegan in our home, but just out of necessity, because it's dairy free, it's soy free and it Mm -hmm. is free. So I believe it uses palm coconut and Yeah, yeah, it actually doesn't taste horrible. Um, and my daughter loves potatoes so I make her little, her separate mashed potatoes with her vegan butter substitute. And she yep. doesn't know the difference. One of the good things with having a kid with food allergies is she doesn't know what she's missing. So she's never tasted regular butter to compare it to like I have to think, oh, this is kind of weird, but I guess it's sort of similar um, to her. It works. Right. So. That was one of uh, our blessings in disguise with, um, well, with both of them and Ruben's food and talent just continued on longer. But mm-hmm. after he was diagnosed, he's like, you know, this is awful that he's diagnosed with um, very early onset inflammatory bowel disease. Mm-hmm. Um, but the similar thing is what you were saying about Lexi, but also could it be a blessing? Cause this is, he might have been in pain, but he was used to it. Right. Like right. then it can only get better from here. <laughs> And he doesn't know what real ice cream's like. He doesn't know what regular bread tastes like. And everybody else is like, oh, this is gross. Right. And to them, it, that's just normal. That's what bread is or that's right. what ice cream is. So yeah, it is. that is something that I'm, I'm glad that she, ever since we started Solid Foods, um, the issue we have with foods, not issue, but the challenge with foods is that every food, every ingredient for her needs to be trialed independently. Um, everything down to spices. So onion, garlic, cinnamon, things that people wouldn't really think of. Um, and then the other issue that we can have is packaging and labeling and food sourcing can change. Um, I just posted recently mm-hmm, yeah. an incident with applesauce, which was one of her very first safe foods. And she loves applesauce. Um, she would probably have an applesauce pouch every day. It was made by this company and they only used organic apples and organic lemon juice. And that was it. There's only two ingredients. Perfect. Um, all of a sudden she started having really increased reflux and nothing could change in her diapers yet. Um, but the reflux was horrific. And I was just like, what are, what are we doing? She's diagnosed, um, at the erosive esophagitis level. So she's diagnosed at the very max dose that some doctors uh, would not even be comfortable prescribing. Her pediatrician won't touch her Pepsid dose because it's it's that high and it's weight-based. So we have been bumping it up consistently. And I remember thinking we are on the maximum dose. Please don't tell me she's building a tolerance to Pepsid and we can't have this anymore because we don't have many other options with the corn allergy for medicine for her. And 
I looked back at my food journal and I was like, what have we changed? Nothing. We didn't change anything. We had just passed our egg trial and we usually give her a week or two of what we call gut rest to just kind Mm -hmm. of, you know, nothing new, just make sure everything's cool. Keep feeding her what we've been feeding her. And then we carefully plan the next food trial. So I remember thinking there's nothing that changed. I don't know what's going on. And I happen to be, this is where social media is helpful. I am in a corn allergy and intolerance group. And one of the moms happened to post a picture of this applesauce pouch and said, my 10 month old literally has four safe foods that he eats. And this is the only thing that's not like literally grown in our own garden. Cause I think his other safe foods are like a peach, a pepper and a tomato. Mm-hmm. And, um, the mom said, you know, does anyone know anything about this? And immediately several other moms of children with corn allergy or intolerance of varying severity said, yes, we used to use these, but rather than using organic lemon juice, they're now using lemon juice concentrate and nothing changed on the packaging. There was, instead of lemon juice, it says lemon juice concentrate. So nothing big changed on the ingredient label. They added one word and it wouldn't look like it would be an issue. But the sourcing, I guess, for lemon juice concentrate versus organic lemon juice, which is literally squeezing a lemon and getting the lemon juice, um, it's corn-based. And I still have yet to find, I like to research and find out where the corn is in these things. So I know why we're avoiding it because Mm -hmm. lemon juice doesn't sound like it should be corny, but it is. And they also changed their packaging. I don't believe the packaging is an issue for us because Lexi's not contact sensitive. She's never reacted to packaging before. Um, but the citric or the lemon, the lemon juice was enough to trigger a reflux reaction. So I called her dietitian and I said, I think this is it. And she was like, you know, her dietitian is amazing. Um, she's talked me off the ledge several times. <laughs> This trouble food. She gives us great recipes. Um, she's wonderful. And even she said, do you think that's enough to trigger it? And I said, I don't know. She drinks an apple, well, drinks, eats an applesauce pouch every single afternoon. That's her snack when she wakes up from a nap. So I said, I'm just going to pull it and we'll just see and not change anything else. And within three days, the reflux was gone again. And so I called her GI and I said, we were initially going to start trialing some more corn derivatives to see if she was still as sensitive because that's the other downside of this type of allergy is you don't know until you try. I literally just feed her things and cross my fingers and we just have to see, does it cause a reaction or not? And um, I called her or her GI and I said, I don't think we need to trial again because I accidentally did and it didn't work well. And he said he thinks that because it was such a small amount it wasn't enough to give a change in her diapers yet. He said, I bet if you would have kept feeding it to her for yeah. another couple of days or weeks, even it would have gotten to a full fledged reaction. It was just such a small amount because it's a preservative. It's a freshening ingredient to keep the applesauce tasting nice and, um, you know, being yeah. nice texture in the pouch. So he said it was a small enough that it was triggering the upper GI symptoms and lower GI symptoms would have followed. But I remember saying to my husband, I feel personally victimized by this applesauce company because it makes sense for them financially. I'm sure it's easier to source the lemon juice that way. But that one tiny ingredient change that for 99% of their consumers, I'm sure they don't even know Mm -hmm. for us was enough to, she went from sleeping almost through the night, usually waking up once or sometimes twice. Um, She went to waking up every hour screaming. And I was just like, what is going on? Because again, it wasn't a food trial time. I have learned enough to brace myself during food trials. We do try to time it around, um, especially a a questionable one. Egg was a big one that we weren't sure about. So we timed it over when my husband would have some time off work, just in case she had a reaction. If I had to be up with her all night, he could take her for some of the day. Um, That's how we used to exist when she was really little. And she was just screaming all the time. We would literally just hand her off and one of us would go nap. Yeah. So you know, I've learned enough to brace myself during reaction or for reactions during food trial times, but I, it wasn't a food trial time. So I wasn't expecting it. And it's, you know, it's an issue we have to watch and everything, things that people wouldn't think of. Um, we were at a friend's house pre COVID and she was teething and I had forgotten to give her Tylenol. And I said, I'm going to have to go. I have to give her Tylenol. She's miserable. And my friend said, do you want Tylenol here? And I said, she can't have your Tylenol. No offense to you. You buy great Tylenol, I'm sure, but it's over the counter. Ours has to be specialty compounded because it can't have corn. 
all the Tylenols have, even if it doesn't have corn syrup, it's citric acid, it's dextrose, it's xanthan gum, it's something. We still brush her teeth with just water because we haven't found a safe toothpaste that doesn't have a binding agent that's corn-based. So it's not just foods, it's ingredients and everything. Everything. It's meds, it's hygiene products. Um, The toothpaste actually just reminded me because when when Ruben started having his IBD issues, we we had checked everything and my, my husband said, you know, well, maybe the toothpaste has gluten in it. <laughs> we had no, we had no clue. Um, I could talk with you for hours and hours, but can you answer my normal, like end of the session thing? So um, you have so much anxiety with trying to keep track of everything for Lexi. Mm-hmm. What do you do for yourself? What have you done for yourself today? Well, today, so today my husband uh, worked, he's working the second shift today. He works a swing shift rotation. So today he woke up with her and I got to sleep in for a little bit. Yay. Um, so that was nice. Um, and then usually what I do, um, I have found one of the things that I do. I had so much anxiety about um, bedtime. And that wasn't even just normal anxiety. That was because anytime she would cry, anytime she would fuss, anytime she would be upset, I would immediately jump to, oh my gosh, she's having a reaction. Something's wrong. She's in pain. And my husband, the rational one, bless him, uh, would be at work. So it was just me doing bedtime by myself. So one of the things, actually her dietitian, who I owe this woman so much, she has helped us so much. She told me, she said, don't turn the monitor on for the first half an hour. And if she needs to fuss, if she needs, you know, she's not screaming, she's not in pain, you know, she hasn't eaten anything dangerous that's going to cause her a reaction. If she needs to just work her fusses out at the end of the day, let her. And I was just like, I can't handle my number one anxiety trigger is Lexi crying. Even if I know, unless it's something that, you know, she just fell and scraped her knee and I can see the cause and effect Mm -hmm. there. He's fussing, especially at bedtime. I, I get in this panic mode. So one thing I started doing was I will jump in the shower. I've turned into a night showerer. (laughs) I will jump in the shower so I can't hear her. And I take me a 10 minute shower and so long shower in the hot water. I can't hear her fussing. And then my system is by the time I get out, if she's still standing up or even sitting up and she's still fussing and whining, then I will allow myself to go back in, offer her the bottle again, give her a hug. You know, mommy's here at night, night time. Most of the time, by the time I get out of the shower, she's at least laid down. She might still be kicking her legs or talking to herself, but she's settled. Um, and that was one thing I had to allow myself permission to, I'm not a bad mom. If she cries a little bit, if she fights bedtime, if she fusses, I'm not hurting her. She's safe. But so many people had told me that. And even I remember at mom's group my first time when she was six weeks old and I said, I can't sleep. And they were like, just let her cry. And I was like, I can't. Now it is safe to let her cry for a few minutes. We don't let her go for very long, certainly not hours or anything, but I had to allow myself permission to, I do need a break. I do need a little bit of time. And I was also sabotaging her sleep because where she was fussing, her GI put it this way, we don't lay down and immediately conk out. We think of things, especially those Mm -hmm. of us with anxiety, go through our day, go through the next day, think of all kinds of things. And he said, for babies, they're just loud. They don't know they're supposed to be quiet at bedtime. So he said that as well. And that's when the dietician said, don't turn the monitor on. Just let her go for a little bit. So I had to give myself permission for that and and to allow her to work out, you know, her pre-bedtime fusses. Right. I would keep going in and she'd be like, why are you here? And it would restart the whole process. So Mm -hmm. I was delaying her bedtime as well. And it's one of those things that everyone told me that. And until I did it for myself, until I figured it out, I didn't believe it, but bedtime's a lot smoother now. So that's one of the small things that, you know, I never thought I'd say showering is a luxury, but mom, I remember I, she was almost six months old before I showered when my husband was not home before mm-hmm. I was brave enough, even though the bouncer was literally right next to me in the shower. Um, well, right outside the shower, but I could touch her right. and I still was too scared. And I don't know, I can't even rationalize why, but I was afraid to be doing anything. I wouldn't cook with raw meat because I was afraid that she would need me and I would have to take the 30 seconds to wash my hands from touching raw meat to get to her. 
And it was just these irrational behaviors that I had that I wasn't willing to let her cry for any amount of time because we were both traumatized from how much she cried and the level at which she cried for so long. So yeah, little things like I, I can cook now and I'll just, you know, I also allow her a little bit more screen time than I thought I would. Yeah. Um, I know the recommendations are no screen time before age two. And you know what? If she watches 15 minutes of a cartoon so I can brush my teeth or I can make a breakfast or coffee for myself, that's okay too. It's, so I've, yeah, I've it's given fine. myself a lot more grace with not being so rigid with rules, which again is hard for someone with anxiety because if it's written in black and white for me, I'm like, well, that's the rule. That's it. Yep. Um, but I've learned to be a lot more flexible. And in that case, she's made me better because there are, I'm, I've never been able to live day by day or go with the flow, but I've learned, I basically have no choice with a baby, <laughs> with a toddler. So, um, that's a yeah, hard lesson. I'm yeah. still learning it. <laughs> It is. It is. It's a struggle. And there are some days when I'm like, why can't you just, I have this routine planned out from wake up to time. We have these activities and you're not cooperating. Um, but yeah, it's, you have to go with the flow. So just learning to be more patient with myself. It's nothing specific that I do necessarily. It's just kind of allowing myself that, okay, I had planned to do the laundry today and we had a rough day because she's teething and it's a, the laundry will be there tomorrow. It, mm-hmm. it will be there tomorrow, <laughs> but just allowing myself to not panic about small stuff and to just say, you know what, I'm still a good mom, even if I turned the TV on so I could brush my teeth and not have her grabbing at me, or I'm still a good mom if I jumped in the shower just so I didn't get upset because she had to cry for 10 minutes before she was ready to go to sleep. So right. just little things like that. And has you have you seen a therapist too? And that helps oh, okay. they, they've been able to help you work through that. I was excited. Cause I, I know these things, but I don't do them. It's until the therapist's appointment that they're like, um, well, it's hard to separate in your rational mind. So even, right. um, you know, I remember the first time she fell down when she was learning to pull the stand and she fell onto carpet and didn't even hit very hard. And I remember texting my, one of my work partners and saying, do I need to go to the ER? And she was like, what would you say if a new mom called 911 and said, my baby fell from standing and they're like all of a foot and a half tall (laughs) carpeted floor and they don't have a mark on their head. I'd be like, okay, relax. It's fine. Call the pediatrician if you're worried, but they're fine. Right. Like, so she's fine, but it's so different when it's your own. And it's also, it is different when, you know, and my heart goes out to anybody who has a spouse or significant other who's in any type of demanding job or, you know, goodness, I can't even imagine having a husband who was deployed or had to do traveling for work because there are definitely times I still count the minutes when my husband gets off work. And when he's late, I, oh yeah, I'm a happy camper, especially if we're having a rough day. I'm like, ah, your job's the worst. So yeah, I had definitely had to see a therapist who, um, I almost had to have somebody else give me permission to mm-hmm. then allow myself to be more gracious with myself and to be more patient. But I had to have somebody else with an outside perspective, tell me it's okay. And you're still doing a good job and you're still a good mom. And Lexi's still safe and happy and she's growing. And, but yeah, I definitely took, I don't see her as much anymore as frequently, but there was a time where we were checking in every week because it um. was it was just really tough. <laughs> right. And that is, that's great that you had that. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I want to respect your time. So I'm just going to say one thing when you were talking, uh, I'm going to be waiting for your book about corn allergies and yeah. how to handle it <laughs> as a mom, because I think you would write an amazing book about it. <laughs> um, and then thank you so much for, for sharing your story. I, again, you ever want to share again, we could talk about different topics each an hour long. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I wanted to thank you for during mom's group. I mean, giving me your number and sharing your experiences. Cause it did help from just hearing someone else that had a kid that had these issues. Cause it's hard when you look around and you see all these other kids who are not struggling with things like eating or sleeping. And you think, you know, those are supposed to be the easy things. And, mm-hmm. um, Definitely. I mean, I know you were there for your newer son, but (laughs) telling me about your older son and that he's doing so well and that you guys, you know, it's still hard. It still sucks. And sometimes I still get a little angry about, you know, how come we have to deal with this and other people don't, and a lot of people don't get it, but 
it was really great to have somebody else. And you were my person in the group that said, you know, look, we've been here and it's hard, but it will get better. And it was, you know, it's hard to believe that when you're in the moment and mm-hmm. people are telling you it won't be forever. And you're just like, are you sure? Cause this seems like forever. So mm-hmm. yeah, oh, it, well, was, thank you. it was really helpful. I so hope you know that. <laughs> oh, that makes, that means so much to me. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> because then I'll cry but no it helped and then when you were like oh here's my number and if you have questions and I was like somebody gets it because you know you know it was people we we all need that right right. we all need that that Um, was probably one of them I mean I met a several wonderful wonderful moms that I'm still in contact with there mm -hmm. but definitely just having somebody to say you know, no, this isn't normal, but it's also not going to last forever and you'll get there and keep pushing. That was the other thing you told me, keep pushing. And that would be my advice for anyone who thinks there's anything suspicious about their kid. Anyone who wants anything investigated, keep listening. Because like I said, we went through three pediatricians and four GIs before we finally found someone who listened and who didn't just think of me as a crazy sleep deprived first time mom that's insisting, Oh, my baby's a bad sleeper. And Mm -hmm. you know, no baby I think is a good sleeper, but I really had to find that strength and that conviction in myself to listen and say, you're wrong. You don't live in my house. You don't hear her. Something isn't okay. And then we got multiple diagnoses and we now have a treatment plan and a team in place. That's wonderful. But it took a while. And if I had listened to that first or that second pediatrician or the first or the second or the third GI, she'd still be drinking soy and dairy based formula. And we would still be wondering why she screams all the time. So mm-hmm. yeah, my, my only advice would be definitely just listen to your gut. And even if you're a first time mom, it doesn't mean that you're crazy. It doesn't mean that you don't know what's going on. Cause it's still your baby and you're the one that's with them all the time. So that was, yeah. Mom's group helped me with that too, to realize that something might be going on and I should continue to pursue it until I find someone who will help. Well, thank you, Allison, for sharing with us today. I have a lot to share of my own story as a mom with a child with food allergies and intolerances, as well as a child with a chronic health condition that I will share sometime in the future. But I just want to summarize a little bit right now. I just want to share that I hope If you are feeling isolated, that you are having to deal with all these extra things as a mom, you know you're not alone. I felt so isolated and crazy almost because I was constantly anxious going through through Ruben's diagnosis and treatment. And it wasn't until I met another mom whose child also travels to CHOP and they have to do shots and Ruben gets infusions every four weeks um, that I really felt like I wasn't alone, that I wasn't the only parent out there with such high anxiety just over going to the doctor. There can just there can be a sensation as a parent with a child with medical needs that you're the only one who's experiencing this or you don't understand the lack of anxiety other parents have every time their kid goes to the bathroom or sneezes or every doctor appointment or every letter that shows up from the insurance company wondering if this is just going to be a statement saying that your child's medication cost $30,000 each visit or if this is the the letter saying that they're denying coverage and they're no longer going to cover your child's medication and now you owe $260,000 for the past however many months. So that that is a lot. There's times that you can feel the sense of jealousy or anger almost seeing other parents that they don't have to worry about holding their child down for them to get their infusion or to get a shot or to not even want to walk into the doctor's office without screaming because they think they're going to have another shot or an infusion that day. Almost always followed by extreme guilt because we see families and kids with 
more dire situations when we're traveling down to CHOP. And we can't help but be in awe of those parents and families that are doing everything they can for their children. And then it comes back around that I think it's really important to remember and remind ourselves and remind each other that we are all doing that. We are all doing everything we can for our kids, no matter if they are perfectly healthy, have medical conditions, or anything. We are doing all that we can for our kids. So that's just to say, I hope you do not feel alone. Reach out. Share your story with people around you if you are feeling alone. Contact me if you'd like to share your story, um, if you'd like to talk, or even if you'd like to share your story on a future episode. You can also just leave a message at uh, the leave the voicemail at join.momsietyclub.com. All right, links to get in contact are all in the show notes. And that's just, I'm just going to end it like that today. Hugs, Mama. You are not alone. The Momsiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. Are you ready to be a Momsiety Club insider? Well, head to join.momsietyclub.com to gain access to emotional and physical support for the stress, anxiety, and overwhelm that comes along with motherhood. There, you'll find information about how to work with me on movement and mindset, one-on-one, or by joining the Momsiety Club membership, 